Uh, we have uh, five to ten minutes. Uh, if uh, we throw it open to the house, any any questions? You have three TSOs, and I am also a part of a SO, so we'll try to see if we can answer some of our queries. There is any? Yeah. Hello, I am Kaushik Das from Technical University of Denmark. Uh, I, I would like to thank all the presenters for a very nice presentation. My question is for uh, to Mr. Sharma from Arcot. You mentioned that uh, you monitor inertia of the system. I, I would like to know more about it. Is it monitoring or estimation? And in case it's monitoring of the inertia, how do you do it? Thank you. Should I answer that question? Yeah, please. Okay. So it's more monitoring. We used to do estimate, but now we're monitoring. We're monitoring the system of it. When I say monitoring, what I mean is we are looking at every generator, synchronous generator that's online, and we're calculating how much inertia that synchronous generator is contributing to the grid, and we're aggregating it and saying at this instant we have this much of inertia. But if I understand it correctly, you have quite a lot of uh, generations in the uh, distribution sy system as well, uh, which are old wind turbines, and you cannot probably don't take account of those uh, ones and also the loads. Uh, right. So, so we are not accounting any inertia contribution from load, wind. Uh, we are not counting any wind. We are only counting uh, inertia from synchronous con uh, synchronous generators. Okay. And uh, you don't use those inertia values for real-time control or something, uh, you just use it for uh, planning and decision makings, right? Not yet for real-time, but we are monitoring in real-time so that if something, if we approach, you know, below 100 gigawatt second, then we are going to take some actions, which is to bring more generation online. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. As a follow-up, Mr. Sandeep, just uh, I wanted to understand what is this uh, 17 millihertz story how did you arrive at this 17 millihertz? Because uh, our understanding is it is 36 millihertz for US, 30 millihertz for 50 hertz. It's coming out of that 6 RPM measurement issue, not to have the flip flop, the dead band in the uh, governors. Uh, right. Particularly when you have uh, uh, you know wind also under primary response. Just right. give us some insight. So. Prior to us, you know, settling on 17, or it is 16.66 millihertz or one RPM dead band, we had 36 millihertz dead band as a requirement. Now, it was a 36 millihertz with a step function, which means if frequency reached 59.964, then you had to provide the response equivalent to 36 millihertz deviation every individual unit. So for a 300 megawatts unit, that's roughly translates to 3.3 megawatts of energy, of governor response it had to provide. Now, what we found out, you know, and this was in a stakeholder process through a lot of involvement from, uh, you know, people that actually work in power plants, that 3.3 megawatts step function puts a lot of stress on generators. And so we decided to remove the step function in our uh, expected governor calculation. And so with, without step function, what that means is if you have 17 millihertz of uh, frequency deviation, then you're going to provide zero megawatts of governor response. If you have 18 millihertz, then you're going to provide governor response equivalent to one millihertz of deviation. And that's where the step function and the non-step function response led to, you know, uh, agreement on 17 millihertz as a dead band. So it actually reduced the expected governor response on generators, and it also reduced the, by removing the step function, it put less stress on generators. And that's how we uh, came to 17 millihertz uh, dead band. So, so then, of course, ARCOT being connected with asynchronous with the rest of the grid, so you could do 17 millihertz. But what happens to other interconnects? Have they also followed suit for this? 
or any other TSOs would like to give an input on this. Uh, sounds very nice because instead of step function of three megawatt jump, let's have the slope. So 17 million makes sense. But why was earlier 36 and now why 17? And if it is 17 in, in ARCOT, why others are not following is my logical next question. Right, so, so there is a lot of, I mean, when we did the 17, mm -hmm. there, was a, there, there were a lot of generators that said actually we could do zero. Okay. Why not zero? And then why 17? And the reason we don't want the generators to be at zero or the generators don't want to be at zero is because they're constantly moving. So we don't want them to be constantly mo moving. And another thing is in ERCOT, we have a governor response requirement for every generator. And so when everybody is at 17 millihertz, then you know the system is more stable around 17 millihertz. So everybody ends up doing less. And that was the argument. Now, other uh, ISOs or other interconnection within North America, I mean, they recently issued a guideline with 36 millihertz. And, you know, it's more important for ERCOT, the primary frequency response, because of its island nature. I don't think it's, it holds the same uh, importance for eastern interconnection, which is about 10 times larger than ERCOT, and WECC, which is, again, really large. And so from that perspective, you know, frequency control is really important for us. And we wanted to, you know, tighten our group setting and dead band and have a better uh, balancing control. Similar experience with 50 hertz or? I think I would have to pass this uh, uh, question on to my colleagues from the system operation. Yeah. Hel Gerdal from NSOE on behalf of the uh, 41 TSOs in Europe. Uh, we are currently discussing that in the five synchronous uh, zones in, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, the outcome is heading towards zero dead ban and only uh, the mi numbers of uh, millihertz for insensitivity. So wh whatever point you are, yes, you have some uh, leeway, but no deliberate uh, dead ban is where things are heading in Europe for the new European network codes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This is Anup Singh from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. Uh, this question is to any one of the speakers. Uh, do we have now sufficient data available from the um, EV charging behavior? Is it possible for now to comment that uh, what will be the potential impact uh, at the grid looking at? Because at least in Europe uh, now, I think uh, Netherlands has already committed that they will have only EVs after, I think, 2030 or something. And I think it's Norway also has a similar thing. So now the, the next challenge, then, I mean, in the, the future conferences will start saying is, what is the impact of the variability of their charging behavior also? Because those, depending upon the type of charger, the fast, the rapid, and the common, or where they are located in the office or the home, uh, anybody has any experience? Yeah, anybody? Maybe we could. Uh could try to gather here. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I can on, only speak for the German case and, and our extrapolations of uh, what electromobility will mean. So if we have a fleet of, let's say, 30 million or 40 million cars, and more or less uh, substituting that, we expect that we need a medium average uh, loading of the batteries of uh, charging uh, of 20 gigawatts. Uh, compared to the figures I, I just showed, it is something that just flows in in the system, so so from from a, let's say transmission point of view, I, I wouldn't think that electro integrating electromobility is a large problem, but it is certainly on the distribution level because uh, then the incidence of having uh, three or five Teslas charging in the same street uh, becomes higher and higher. We and we calculated that there's something like a Poisson uh, distribution, uh, and if you surpass some let's say four or five million cars, then this probability becomes so high that, that uh, the distribution operators really have to care about it. Yeah. Actually, uh, Shruti from CRC is sitting, she may explain. But we have seen a uh, study where this EV charging, there is a MATLAB module, which simulates. But why does it simulate like this? Is it a 
uh, you know, specific area wise, that was not very clear to us. But uh, yes, there are number of standard modules now available which will mimic the charging station's behavior. So I do have a, I don't have experience, but I do have an opinion on your question. And so my opinion is, you know, generally in Texas or in the US, most of the electricity rate for consumers are based on fixed price. And with fixed price, you don't have a lot of incentive on when you charge your you know, EV because you're going to be paying the fixed price. But at some point, you know, to hedge the risk, the load serving entities will you know, start providing uh, time of usage uh, charges. With that, what you'll see is you know, the EVs will be charging during the off-peak hours, and then during the peak hours, as the prices are high, they will not be charging. At least that's my opinion. Perhaps a short uh, adder. We recently made a short uh, study on this uh, internal study on, uh, on exactly this question also with the same result uh, uh, Mr. Hoffman uh, just mentioned. Um, and on the distribution level uh, specifically, um, we saw as a, as a solution that there, there will be a coordination mechanism necessary uh, in order to, to prevent um, <clears throat> uh, overload of the grid, of the distribution grid. Um, with an open answer who should uh, uh, do this, who should uh, make the coordination, but most probably it makes sense that the, uh, the DSO takes over this role, so the uh, load will then be uh, kind of, um, uh, or there has to have to be incentives uh, that the um, electric vehicles can be switched off by the uh, grid operator, which, for example, can be incentivized by uh, lower grid fees. Yeah. <coughs> I had a question for uh, ERCOT. You mentioned um, using wind for frequency response. Sorry, right here. Okay. Um, uh, Alex hogevin rudder I'm from uh, Manitoba Hydro International, currently based in, uh, in New Delhi. Um, you mentioned that you could use wind for frequency response, but you, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you said only curtailed wind could be used for frequency response. Now, most grid operators have a goal to try and minimize uh, renewable energy curtailment. So is there a way to get kind of the best of both worlds, or is it you have one or the other? You either have curtailed wind and you have frequency response, or you don't have curtailment and you don't have frequency response? So you have frequency response from wind all the time, but on the low side of the frequency, you're only responding when you have a headroom, okay? And that's not the uh, requirement just for wind, it's for any other resource in ERCOT, is on the low side, you're providing response only when you have headroom, and wind farms will only have a headroom on the low side when they are curtailed. On the high side, they're always providing frequency response. Now, and to add, on the low side, we do procure ancillary service for frequency response. On the high side, every generating resource has a headroom that's operating, unless it's uh, limited by uh, LSL, lo low level or min gen level, and so everybody's responding. Uh, I'm UK Verma from uh, POSOCO, Power System Operation Corporation. Uh, my question is to Mr. Henkel from 50 Hertz. Uh, you said that uh, your uh, generators uh, provide the frequency response, primary frequency response. So do you compensate the generator for giving this type of response in any way? Yes, it's a, it's a market mechanism, so uh, we as TSOs determine how many frequency response we need. For example, for uh, Germany, it's around 600 uh, megawatt of primary control we need, and for the whole synchronous area, it's around 3,000 uh, megawatt which is needed. <clears throat> and then there's a tender which is now being switched from, uh, let's say in the past we had monthly tenders or weekly tenders, and right now we're on the way to daily tenders. So every day for tomorrow, uh, or for the day after tomorrow, there will be a tender um, for <clears throat> which power plants can offer a frequency response. So in case uh, renewables are pre-qualified and uh, are in the, uh, are the, the cheapest solution, they can offer their services, or it can also be, uh, let's say, uh, running power plants, conventional power plants, battery storages, which we see, uh, but also uh, demand response, uh, they also always can, can participate. So I understand, uh, do you mean to say that there could be some generators, if they are not participating in the market, they may not be giving you the primary response? Sorry, I, d I didn't get the last no. part. <clears throat> what you said, uh, 
From this, I infer that uh, there could be some generators, if they are not participating in the market, they will not be giving you the primary response even? Yes, exactly. So they are not forced to participate. They are forced to be able, by the, by the grid code, they must be able, technically, to uh, provide uh, primary, but it's, it's an economical uh, incentive um, <clears throat> which, is, which is given uh, in order to offer this, uh, this product, and the plant operator can decide whether he wants to do this or not. It's quite a, let's say, quite a high economic uh, incentive because primary control is something valuable. We've seen, uh, we see prices of uh, <coughs> uh, 2,000, 3,000 uh, euros per megawatt per week in the uh, currently uh, uh, tender, in the current tenders. Um, yeah, this is quite attractive and uh, we have learned uh, in the past two years that it's even uh, sufficient in order to finance uh, battery storages and uh, let battery storages uh, provide um, uh, primary control. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And with this, we come to the end of uh, this session. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, audience. We break for tea for 20 minutes. That brings us back at 17.10. 17.10 or 17.15, somewhere in between. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.